Since I was a teenager, I've been collecting older video game consoles, and while I originally got into it so I could play games like Ninja Gaiden or Pokemon Stadium, I've developed a strange obsession with one rarely talked about feature on a lot of these consoles. Link ports. Sure, USB is great, but these expansion ports are a lot more hackable to a novice modder like me, and don't require reading several hundreds of pages just to get started working with them. So yeah, last video wasn't just a random one-off about hijacking the link port of an older device. I'd say there's a 90% chance you see another video about, I don't know, a Sega Genesis Power 3D printer, or a submarine with a PlayStation as the control computer. But even before my calculator video, there was a system with a link port I was already interested in. The Game Boy Color. I considered doing a Pokemon trade between me and my friend on the other side of the state with a Wi-Fi connected link cable or something, or maybe making a Game Boy controlled rover, but as a former weeb, I feel like there's a project I'm obligated to do before anything else. And of course, that's to play Bad Apple. It's a bit of a meme to play this video on anything that could even remotely be used as a screen, and I've seen people use flashcards or other cartridges to play it, but I've never seen somebody try to do it through the link port. Here's what I'm thinking. First, design a circuit that connects a Game Boy to a computer. Then write a video encoder to turn regular video into something compatible with a Game Boy. Finally, write a video decoder program for a Game Boy and run it off a flashcard. This should let us send pretty much any video stream to it, and I'll show you some of the other stuff I managed to pull off with this setup later, but for now, let's start with the hardware. Game Boy Link protocol is pretty simple. Inside a link cable, there are six different wires. With two Game Boys connected, either Game Boy can pulse the clock line eight times to exchange the byte in their serial registers, but you do have to take care to not have both Game Boys try and send it at the same time. That's really the whole protocol. No stop bits, no parity bits, no chip select, just a super simple serial protocol. The OG Game Boy can do this at a measly eight kilohertz, but the Game Boy Color can do it at 512. Besides the fact that the Game Boy Color can do, well, color, that's the main reason we're using it. Also, its screen isn't Shrek piss yellow, which is nice. We should be able to have a microcontroller act as a converter between a USB serial connection and the link connection so that my PC can send encoded frames to a microcontroller and then the Game Boy can download those frames. Now that I'm a bit more comfortable designing PCBs since the last project, I decided it'd be good practice to make a custom PCB with a link connector on it, meaning we won't need to create a super janky breakout cable. We could just plug directly into the board. First of all, we're gonna need to shift the five volt signals of the link cable down to 3.3 volts. As the microcontrollers I have in mind for this product all run at 3.3 volts. To cut to the chase, this is the board that I came up with. For the clock line, I'm using the MOSFET-based level shifter I used for our last project. When either the Game Boy or the microcontroller pull the clock line to ground, the other side will be pulled down as well. But for the data lines, I chose these tiny buffers. Unlike the other level shifter, these guys only allow data transmission in one direction. And then finally, some status lights to show when either side is connected to power. And to have these boards manufactured, I use today's sponsor PCBWay. PCBWay provides a menagerie of services you can use to bring your own mods, hacks, or products to life. For this project, I'm using the PCB manufacturing and assembly services, but they also provide resin printing, CNC machining, injection molding, and laser cutting. And getting set up is super simple. After filling out our component values in our schematic, we can simply use the free PCBWay KiCad plugin to automatically create a PCB assembly order. PCBWay can take care of sourcing all the parts and assembling the board. Now, I'll be providing the design files for this PCB on my GitHub, but let's say you aren't interested in this particular project. Well, then perhaps you'll find something interesting in PCBWay's shared project section. It is Christmas time, so maybe this LED snowflake catches your eye. If you're more like me though, this little handheld Lisp computer is where it's at. Right now, you can get 10 bare PCBs for $5, and there's a special offer on an assembly for $29. With the free $5 coupon you get as a new member, that means you can get 10 bare PCBs for free, only shipping payment required. Links are in the description, and thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Sadly, while PCBWay did do a great job manufacturing my boards, I had accidentally swapped the data lines and didn't notice before ordering the PCB, meaning these boards aren't able to transfer any information. And it's not like my next three revisions went great either. My second revision, I swapped the lines, but I somehow managed to overdraw current from my Game Boy Color, killing it. After revising that board and acquiring some new victims, I learned that the level shifter I had chosen for the clock lines essentially just craps itself at 512 kilohertz. So for the last revision, I went with the same level shifters we've been using for the data lines, since I know for a fact they work at 512 kilohertz. But they are unidirectional, so I had to choose a direction. I chose to set it up so that the Game Boy would always be in control of the clock line. This seemed like the easiest way if it wanted the Game Boy to be responsible for synchronizing transfers to the start of a new frame. On the bright side, I was able to get a lot of practice soldering SMD components, and I also learned a couple tricks, like how flux is basically magic for preventing solder bridges, or how my roommate's toothbrush is great at cleaning flux off freshly soldered PCBs. So now with a PCB that at least seems to be working electrically, we need a microcontroller that can detect pulses on the clock line, read whatever is on the receive line, and set the transmit line to whatever bit is next to be sent. 
I figured that the ESP32 would be up to this task, running it over 400 times the speed of a Game Boy Color. But comparing speeds like this can be deceiving. I tried several different methods and was only able to recognize signals up to maybe 200 kilohertz with the ESP32, less than half of what we need. Now, is this because my code is entirely unoptimized and I only have a rudimentary understanding of microcontrollers? Almost certainly. So what's the solution? Maybe a fancy circuit to hijack the super fast SPI peripheral? Overclock the ESP32? Or maybe the solution is to use a slower microcontroller? Huh? This is a Raspberry Pi Pico. It runs at half the speed of the ESP32, but has two extra processors that literally do nothing except manipulate GPIOs extremely quickly. So quickly, in fact, that people have used it to do everything from adding USB host support, output video, or even controlling the parallel bus of a flashcard. Like a good software developer, I stole code from examples and read just enough documentation to vaguely understand what I was doing and wrote this PIO program. Looks complicated, but it's pretty simple. First, we initialize variables, then we grab whatever data we need that's ready to send, then we loop eight times, each time waiting for the clock line to go low, shifting a bit to the output line, waiting for the clock line to go high again, shifting a bit in from the receive line, and then transferring the result to the main CPU for further processing. All these extra 31 sprinkled around are because it turns out these extra cores are so good at their job that I had to slow it down a little with delays to prevent some weird situations where it detected clock transitions that weren't there. This works perfectly, passing my very basic test of sending ascending numbers from the Game Boy, so I designed one final PCB with everything we need on it, alongside a 3D printed case that has a port for USB on one side and a link port on the other. On my PC, I have an encoder script cobbled together from other Game Boy video projects that does the following. Take a video stream, downscale it to the Game Boy's resolution, break it up into 368 pixel by 8 pixel tiles, and either convert it to grayscale or generate a four color palette. We are using the Game Boy Color after all. Only four colors? Yeah, while this might be a problem that could be solved with another few months of effort, the PPU, which is effectively the Game Boy's graphics card, isn't exactly the most capable peripheral. PPU splits up the screen into three layers, but we're only using the background layer. To display an image, you load 360 tiles, fill the tile map with ascending numbers, write an interrupt to swap between tile banks right when this overflow in the tile map happens, and assign one of the eight four color palettes to each tile. With each palette only being four colors, we can only have a maximum of 32 colors on screen, but we can also never have more than four colors in a single tile. You're not gonna find an encoding algorithm already written that can handle this set of constraints to produce an accurate image, but we can simply use grayscale or four color palette generated from each frame as a workaround. This is all sent to the RPI Pico via USB and stored in a buffer which is simultaneously being read by the Game Boy over serial and loaded into the PPU's VRAM as we just discussed. At 16 bytes a tile and a transfer rate of 512 kHz, it takes about 5 frames to load a whole image, or 12 FPS. We also lose some frames doing DMA transfers from main memory into VRAM, which also causes this insane screen tearing. But if you are okay with the drop in resolution, you can get full 60 FPS by simply preloading a set of tiles that can be used to draw arbitrary frames. Instead of loading new tile data, you instead just upload new tile map each frame. Since it's 360 bytes as opposed to the 5760 bytes when loading a new set of tile data, this can definitely be done in under a 60th of a second. Quick editor's note, but if you're interested in learning more about the Game Boy or Game Boy Color in a bit more detail than this, I highly recommend the Pan Docs and other tutorials on gbdev.io. So finally, let's see what sort of things we can do with this setup. Now I do realize it's a little ironic to use the Game Boy Color to play a monochrome video, but it's the whole reason we're doing this. I've already posted the full version of Bad Apple as a separate video, and I definitely agree with the feedback I've gotten that the low-res version is a lot more pleasing to watch than the high-res version. There's something especially fun to watch about these sections that look a bit more 3D being rendered in such a low resolution. And I'm not 100% sure why, but the high-res version has a bunch of little white dots sprinkled through the black areas. Probably related to the dithering algorithm I'm using, which is something we're actually going to want for other video sources we're going to try, but it is weird that it messes up the pure black areas of the screen so much. I should also probably address the lack of audio. We're already spending all of our time transferring video data, so trying to do PCM audio is almost impossible. And now that I think about it though, it might be possible to cram MIDI messages in the frame data, but that's something to tackle in the future. For now, let's recreate the Game Boy camera with a modern webcam. I personally think that the grayscale full res version looks the best, but if you want a super trippy option, the color version is the way to go. I don't even want to talk about the low res version. It's basically useless unless you get right up to what you're trying to film, but at least it's got a high frame rate. And messing around with a camera got me thinking. Popular streaming software OBS can create something called a virtual webcam, which looks like a normal webcam to your system, but it's entirely controllable via software. With that in mind, I set up this jerry rig of a stream to let watchers donate videos and have them play on the Game Boy. I'm thinking about doing one of these streams the next few weeks, so if you guys are interested, let me know in the comments below. And finally, before we wrap up, we've got to try out some games. It is a Game Boy after all. Fast-paced games like Ultra Kill and Doom Eternal are almost unplayable, with the low FPS, constant screen tearing, and color shifting making it impossible to see anything that's happening. And if you thought that was bad, the low-res version, while smoother, is basically incomprehensible. Weirdly enough, the grayscale version seems to be better. Just because you don't have a million colors flashing in your face as FFmpeg screams in pain trying to figure out how to turn several hundreds of colors into four. 
what about a game meant for a system like this? Using OBS, we can simply screen share a Game Boy emulator. Coming full circle, the colors are completely washed out and we've added screen tearing a low FPS2 game that never had it, and that's a win in my book. And because we can just do screen sharing, we can also browse YouTube videos. And with that, I think that's everything. Now, if you're interested in setting this up for yourself, the project is up on my GitHub page, and I'll be in my Discord to answer questions if you encounter issues. And of course, thanks to my patrons for supporting me while I work on these projects. You guys helped hold me accountable for this project, so I hope you enjoyed it. And for those of you who stuck around this long, thanks for watching, and I'll see you with another video soon.